discuss why this so this is my intervention I thought it'd be appropriate to discuss why this intervention is needed um, and so we hear the news of, of these huge um, those headlines are coming from Africa. This place is in a, in, and I, I made it to uh, discuss in more detail um, the problems that we're having in Ethiopia and how we fix it. Problem I heard mentioned facing um, for this health science classes in Ethiopia. Now, the water crisis is very prevalent um, in the whole country of Africa, but um, the problem that we'll be looking at today is, is in Ethiopia, and that's probably the place where the water crisis is, is most prevalent. And so water crisis pretty much refers to um, where there's major droughts and there's a shortage of water. Usually when I think of shortage of water, I think of sanitary water. Or so um, for drinking and things like that. Um, but really, um, the water crisis is a different shortage of water or drinking. The second being a shortage of sanitary water to bathe in your hands and to do things like that. And it's actually the water, um, the sanitary water needed to bathe in that. Um, causes a lot of the waterborne illnesses, which we'll talk about in a little bit, that are super prevalent. Um, so the water crisis, like I said, it's, um, it's where droughts hit Ethiopia and they're, and they're left without clean drinking or sanitary water. Um, lots of times in, in some rural parts of Ethiopia, women and children have to walk up to six hours just to collect water. The water they're collecting, um, they get it from these shallow unprotected ponds, um, which are infested with bugs and, and other things like that, that uh, carry a lot of diseases and bacteria. And if it's not from these ponds, they get it from um, these shallow uh, wells. But, you know, whatever place they're getting it from, the sources of water they're getting it, it's, it's not providing clean water. And some statistics you can see here, 48% um, of the people of um, Ethiopia don't have access to drinking water or clean drinking water. Um, and so that's, you know, about half of the uh, state of Ethiopia doesn't have access to drinking water, while 21% have access to sanitary water. And so um, only about a quarter or less of a quarter um, are able to um, have water to, to bathe in, to wash their hands in. And you can only imagine you're not able to wash your hands or to bathe or to wash your hair. Um, there's going to be a lot of waterborne illnesses or waterborne diseases that are going to run rampant. And um, that's what's happening in Ethiopia. And some of the most common ones um, cholera. Cholera is pretty much um, see hydration, super severe um, diarrhea, and things like that. And, and on these, um, is, um, the kids, and they tend to. These younger kids become so young and they're It's not more of an effect on the cholera, which is very severe disease. There, another common illness is hepatitis A. Hepatitis A is a, is a disease and it's trans. Um, drinking of unsafe water, but also you know, bathing or using um, unsanitary water when, when washing your hands and things like that. Um, and so, like I said, a lot of states and things are not as um, Ethiopian. You don't have intense. And so, here, here's some statistics about these waterborne illnesses that are. See how Ethiopia is going to percentage wise. That's of infants being under five mortality rates. So kids 
about 1,000, which means, you know, for every 1,000 five year olds, 88 are the passing away. For, um, is, is, which is really, we can say these mortality rates compare, but all this stuff comes from unsanitary water, water and unsanitary water. Um, in fact, according to um, WHO, which is the World Health Organization, they recently did a study about um, Africa and specifically Ethiopia. They said that 80% of this mortality rate and of these deaths can be correlated uh, to the shortage of water, to the water crisis. And so that's why um, our intervention will be, um, I guess, focusing on this specific problem. Hi, my name is Morgan Church, and I'm just going to talk about the overview of our intervention and just a really quick, brief uh, introduction um, about our project. So the goal of our project would be to provide biosand filters for households that have access to water sources but aren't able to clean or purify it. Use a biosand filter which is a very, it's a century old technology that uses layers of sand and micro um, bacterial film to remove waterborne pathogens um, with just the simple gravitational force. The filters can be built locally using available materials and labor comprised of a plastic or concrete container of an office water cooler. And then it is filled with layers of sand and dirt and gravel, um, and the dirty water is poured on top. And as it's poured on top through the container, uh, the water ends up because of the gravitational force and creates um, water at the end of it. Um, the clean water would exit through a plastic pipe at the bottom of the filter. Through studies, biofilters can remove more than 90% of um, bacteria and 100% of parasites. The water is tasteless, it's clean in color, and it's odorless. Super easy because there's no moving parts or pieces to repair. Um, so no electricity or plumbing is required, which is great for villages and uh, other areas that don't have access to, to electricity and things like that. On top of providing cleaner, we would increase the locally kind local local members or local, um, people in the area that would oversee the operations and um, that would help with uh, just making sure that the filtration systems worked properly. We would also empower the local communities to maintain the clean water practices by educating their community. So, yeah. As part of my video portion, I am going to discuss the problems with implementing a bio sand filter that other um, groups or organizations may come in contact with. Um, not just the groups, but also maybe the uh, people who are actually utilizing the bio sand filter. Uh, so as such, there are three different questions I want to address regarding how it's developed and what is being done to actually put it into place and why we're actually implementing the biosand filter. As such, this will help to kind of bring up different issues um, that may um, occur as different organizations implement, again, the biosand filter. So, um, as such, the biosand filter is already created by having a container, gravel, um, filtration sand, a bio layer, which is actually doing much of the um, uh, filtering portion for the water. Uh, also, of course, the water has to have a, a way to actually come into the container. Uh, there also needs to be an outlet tube so that the water can get out or the clean, the newly clean water can actually escape from the um, filtering container into a new storage container. And so as such, these are all different um, tools that are needed to create that filter. So sometimes when implementing this um, filtration system, then tools actually need to be accessed. Um, so this is where the group or organization would then come in, hopefully, with these uh, materials and be able to offer those to the third world countries 
um, that would be in need of this. Um, the containers could be fairly simple. Container, plastic, um, bucket of some sort. And then as long as there's some sort of tube that actually draws the water, kind of like a capillary tube that draws the water out of the main container into the new filtered water container, then um, and that's fine. So as long as it's just um, able to contain the water and then get it out. Um, something else that may be a problem with not just, again, implementing it, but with the um, people who are actually using the bio sand filter would be how the water gets in, but how to keep other things out. So a very cheap and expensive way to do this, plastic cups. They can actually just use plastic cups, poke holes in them. The water can then drain in by a rain or however other source may come in, um, just as long as, of course, they're stuck on there and don't. And as long as they have holes and then the wire can come in and other things, like critters or whatever else can't come in as well. Um, those are things that are actually needed in order to um, implement the bio sand filter. Uh, furthermore, upkeep and restoration are something that need to be taught. Um, so when oops, come into to play this filter they need to teach those who are using it how to keep it maintain it and clean it or even restore it if needs be if it's somehow damaged they need to know how to put it together and it's actually fairly simple as we discussed earlier something else is um, being able to tell the quality of water and whether or not it's actually drinkable uh, another thing is also the flow rate so um, these are all things that mostly are for the people who are using the filter so that they don't have problems later on down the road so that this implementation um, isn't actually um, pointless. So with the flow rate, it, want, it needs to be slower so that the quality or the the water quality actually increases. So somehow with the reduced flow rate it actually increases the quality of water. Um, this doesn't, we don't want it to be any less than a liter per minute though and that's something that those using it actually need to know. So aside from the upkeep, water quality and flow rate, uh, the microbial analysis is also something that professionals can teach those who are using it as well. So talking about um, some of the barriers that could be encountered with using a biosan water filter. Um, I'll also be discussing some different methods to overcome those barriers. Uh, so for the first one, like all filters, uh, they do have their limitations. And water filter, uh, manual labor is needed for cleaning. And if this is neglected or abused, or not done properly, then the result is that the filter won't work accurately and the lifetime of the filter is lowered. Um, so, so to fix this, uh, people would need to be informed. So classes would be needed to be put in place to teach members how to clean these, these filters. Uh, in these classes, they would be taught biosand water filters to clean and what to use to clean. One method is called the swirl and dump procedure. It's uh, how it's done by putting water into the filter, swirling around, and then the materials that have been captured are released, and then that water is then dumped out, and then the procedure is repeated again. And so the water is clean at that point. Um, these filters can get clogged with either within the first couple of weeks or within a year, uh, depending on the location and what is in the water. So it would be crucial to get this information out early uh, so they can get the most out of their water filter. Cleaning would include the diffuser plate, outlet tube, lid, and the outside surfaces of the filters. Um, another barrier that is often noted with these filters is that the filter needs to be used on a regular basis. Um, if this project were to be carried out in Ethiopia, I don't think that would be a problem. I think it would get plenty of use and uh, 
the community would definitely benefit from those filters. Uh, the problem with biosand filters is that they can be especially hard to move. They are so heavy. Uh, proper placement would need to be discussed and carefully thought about before installation so that the movement would not be needed. One source I found said that slow sand filters, also known as biosand water filters, are less effective at removing uh, microorganisms from cold water because as temperature decreases, the biological activity within the filter declines. We need to be warmer than colder if people would want to get the most out of their water filter. Another source discussed how water with uh, high turbidity levels can quickly clog the fine sand in these filters. Um, so we need to be just properly cleaned and washed after this. So overall, the main barriers or concerns with biosand water filters is um, in regards to cleanliness. So some water has a lot of organic chemicals, uh, dissolved inorganic substances such as metals and other things in it. Uh, fine clay is also in a lot of water. So while these are harder to treat, as long as it's the filter is being cleaned properly and as needed, these shouldn't be a problem. 